again, Mike Higgins here from Paradise, and uh, he's going to tell us about big urban approaches to improving. I understand. I can help. Well, we hope. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, Danny, and, and the other organizers. Great so far. Yeah, and so my group for a long time has been using theory and mostly computation to model what we call physics-based modeling of uh, self-assembly, like viruses and large biological complexes, and then also active matter, so non-equilibrium self-organization. Uh, and recently, we, we got started to think about also using data-driven methods to help with this. And I have some slides today on motivating why we decided that that would be a good idea and some preliminary progress we made along those lines. And so the first question is why? And so as I think all of you know, the matter is a, a material whose components uh, generate forces, consume energy to generate forces that will drive motion and will create active stresses. And these active stresses, when the components interact with each other, undergo this so-called inverse cascade, the larger scales, eventually leading to these spectacular macro scale behaviors. And this underlies a lot of uh, functions that are critical to living organisms, such as the functions that you see here. And in the past uh, decade or so, Okay. The past decade or so, uh, researchers have made synthetic analogs of these constituents. And so this has the potential to transform material science, or, you know, that's what you tell your funding agency, um, because that gives you the, the potential to create materials that recapitulate these types of attributes or other types of attributes you can't get from a passive equilibrium material. But there is a there is a problem with this. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think your computer is supposed to be. You, you yeah, yeah, that's your that's problem. Problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I was trying to get to the Get online because it's over C. Okay. I'll do that shortly. Okay. So, so the problem is that the vast majority of the systems that are created this way are unstable to uh, chaotic behavior. Uh, so this is the system that I'm sure you're all familiar with, developed by Vladimir Gojic a system of microtubules and clusters of kinesins. And it's intrinsically unstable to this chaotic behavior with defects forming and streaming through the system. Um, and of course, you, you're not, you're, it's impossible to get uh, productive work or a function out of a system like this. Now, biological systems have evolved tightly regulated mechanisms to uh, overcome this by uh, controlling the propagation of active stresses in space and time. Just as one, you know, very well-known example, if the function is a cell moving toward a particular target and underlying that there are, that the cell has carefully choreographed motions of cytoskeletal filaments and motors in space and time so that it pushes the cell forward in, in the right direction. And so if we want to be able to create synthetic materials that have similar types of, of functions, then we also need to be able to program in space and time the, the active stresses. And if we want to do that, though, this is quite challenging because we need accurate models in order to design or understand how to exert that type of spatiotemporal control. And it turns out to be very challenging to, as I'm sure you all know, to, to get accurate models for these systems. Uh, and, and so obvious reasons for that are that 
these systems are far from equilibrium, and so most of the tools of stat mech can't be applied. Uh, something which may be a, a little bit less obvious is uh, just how complicated and I would say dirty these systems are. And so this again is the system de developed by Vonamere. So it consists of these uh, bundles of microtubules that extend outward from both ends. And so basically every little line you see here corresponds to one of these bundles. And each of these bundles contains on the order of a million microtubules and an order of 10 more kinesins in there. And so you want to develop some kind of a first principle model that's going to tell you how, for example, if I change the properties of the motors, so I switch to say a different kinesin, how that's going to affect the macro scale behaviors. I mean, that's just a very formidable problem and I don't think it's gonna be possible to do that anytime soon. And so the question is, can data-driven methods allow us to sidestep some of that effort and get there sooner. So in particular, can they not only allow us to, to generate models that, that accurately predict the, the dynamics given the microscopic parameters, but uh, to my mind, even more importantly, can they teach us some physics at the same time as we're doing that? So that's what, what we've uh, set out to do the, the last few years. Uh, and we actually have taken two approaches to this. So one is to, to, to take data and try to use that with an automated model discovery tool to obtain accurate physics equations. And then we have uh, combined that with methods from control to try to uh, drive the system toward particular states. The other is you just throw the model out all together and develop deep learning tools in reinforcement learning to try to control the dynamics of the systems. And to the extent that I have time, I'll tell you uh, something about both of these, but I'm gonna start with the data-driven model discovery. But actually before even getting to that, it turns out that there's a, a, a problem right from the outset in working with these systems, particularly in 3D. Most of what I'm gonna tell you about today is testing that we've done on 2D systems, in particular, the system I just showed you from Zwanamere, but we're also working with more recently developed 3D system. And it turns out to be very difficult to extract accurate field data. So in particular, the uh, velocities and director fields from these samples using traditional image analysis techniques. So obviously you need to be able to do that if you're gonna apply any kind of a data-driven method. And fortunately, machine learning actually already uh, presented a solution to that difficulty. And I'll just show you that quickly. Um, first, in order to extract the, the director field. Um, oh, and I should have said right from the outset that this, what I'm describing here is a collaboration with um, experimentalists, Seth Braden and Vladimir Dojic. Uh, we're working with a machine learning expert in Brandeis, Peng Yu Hong. And then it's all in collaboration also with a part of Asker and my colleague. Um, and so this uh, was working with Peng Yu Hong and his student, Yunri Li, developed a deep learning approach to automatically extract the director field and identify defects uh, directly from fluorescence data or from the experiments. And this turned out to be quite successful because it turns out that the machine learning approach uh, is much more reliable and accurate than the traditional methods. And this is just briefly showing a couple of examples of that. And basically what happens is the traditional method is easily pooled when you have a large gradients in the director field. And in particular, when those gradients sometimes are um, false gradients arising because of changes in illumination, either because the system is going out of focus or because of gradients in illumination across the sample. And the machine learning method is much less likely to get pooled by that. This is just showing a couple of examples. So here, the images on the left 
are from full scope. And so these serve as brown truth. And then this image is what the traditional method detects. And this is what the machine learning method detects. And you see here that the traditional method identified falsely a splay wolf. And similarly, the traditional method gets the position of a, of a defect wrong here. So this approach seems to be quite um, effective and useful and also required much less parameter tuning than uh, the traditional method does. Say so, so, so the, the machine learning received the raw image? Yeah. Um, what what is exactly is pulse code? I mean, so so pulse code that? is a um, type of polarization uh, microscopy, of which um, when you can do it, it's quite accurate. But it, it, it turns out you can't do it in in many situations. But in this example, you can. And so in this example, you can. More information in the, so that you get a complete and check. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I went through this. So this way. Yeah, right. Yeah, so the, the, the machine learning is working on you just have fluorescently labeled microtubules and you take images of them. Yeah. So, sorry, what's the kind of brief physical basis in, in, within the traditional method? So the, the traditional method, you're basically detecting gradients in, in the sample and then computing the director. The machine learning method, you're you're putting it through like a layer of Bohr filters and then a bunch of convolutional neural nets spitting out. So could you say that just machine learning? I mean, it has more tools in its toolbox to like. Is, is it is it surprising that it can do better than traditional? No, it's not because like uh, the both both the the the, the advance that you and Reed made with using these the Bohr filters, which are very good at detecting features on particularly at when you have features on different scales. You combine that with convolutional neural nets, you would expect to do that. The, the disadvantage is, is it takes a lot more uh, RAM and it's a lot more expensive than traditional approach. So you don't, you know, you don't get anything for free. So what about processing time? How long does it take to? It, yeah, at the moment, it, it's not fast. You have to run it on a, on a GPU. Um, and you need a good GPU for it to be fast enough to kind of do it on the fly. Like, you know, so you have to spend, you know, whatever, 5,000 bucks on a good GPU, but we're hoping to get it, get it pared down faster. I think that the, the actually more impressive and interesting case is dealing with the velocities. Um, this may be more interesting to experimentalists than theorists, but so, so typically we get the velocities from PIV. Um, and we discovered through this, so, so we, we quickly discovered that it wasn't going to work in 3D, they're just way too low resolution and noisy. Uh, this, this approach actually taught us that it doesn't work very well in 2D either. Um, and, and so our uh, postdoc working with uh, uh, Peng Yu and me, Fu Tran, developed an alternative approach, uh, which again comes from the computer vision literature and it's approach known as optical flow. And this is a technique that you give it a sequence of images that will identify the objects in those images and then compute their velocities from frame to frame. And this is showing an example you can find on Google where it's been applied to traffic and the green lines are where it's identified the velocities of all, all of the vehicles. So who adapted this to active pneumatics? The, the, the difficulty here was we don't actually have a ground truth because it turns out the PID is unreliable. So he had to develop an unsupervised learning technique. But so he did that, or he adapted one to, to active pneumatics. What I'm showing here is is we're applying it to again one of these samples where it's uh fully the the microtubules every microtubule is fluorescently labeled. This is the result you get from PIV, and this is what you get from optical flow. And what you're supposed to see is they're just completely different. And so one of them is totally wrong, and we concluded that it's the PIV because in the same sample, 
on, on another channel, so with, with another dye, they sparsely label the microtubules and then do the same thing. And here you see that the PIV, while it's still pretty noisy and low resolution, it at least now matches the optical flow, which is the same as it is for, for the, the, the fully labeled. And so the conclusion is PIV is just simply inaccurate when you have fully labeled samples. And this is an issue because you need fully labeled samples in order to extract the directed view. But I think just much more generally, there's going to be a lot of systems like this where PIV is, is not going to work under conditions that, that you need to apply it. And this optical flow seems to be much more uh, robust and, and reliable, and it's also actually easier to implement. Yeah? So if I understand, so I mean, in the, in the sparsely labeled PIV, it, it would be an algorithm that's looking for little dots and then trying to say, okay, here's a dot and here's how much it moved. And that's the local. So well, the, the PIV is, is basically looking at how, um, how things change from pixel to pixel from each frame. Yeah. So it's not exactly particle, it's not particle tracking. It's trying to identify from one frame to the next. I'm no expert in PIV, but it's trying to identify from one frame to the next how things in each pixel have moved. Okay, but I thought the particle of it was that it was looking for either, either particles you introduce or, or yes, labels. So, exactly. So, so here it's finding the label, like, but not finding it there. Well, well, yeah, if you have a star set of points that you're trying to walk from, it's easier to do that. Yeah, you don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a direct pull thing, you've got to somehow track features of right. a rather undefined character. Yeah. Which is something that the machine doesn't do that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 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 So it's just that it, 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 it's identifying these features, which can be much more general than tracking those. Yes, yeah, so, so the machine learning is good at this because um, you, you, you actually do this, um, it, you, you have a series of so called levels where, it, where you're looking at much different resolutions. And so at, at the lowest, le highest level, which is very low resolution. It does it first, and then it takes that information to the next level, and so on, until you get down basically to to the single pixel level. And so, and in each of, of these levels, it has a whole bunch of these convolutional neural nets, and so it's it's much a, better able to to pick out the features that way, it's less likely to get. So, so the main difference between the PID and the flow is this convolution density because. The flow is looking at the intensity of the uh, of bright the pixel of So, so, so it, it's a combination of having the convolutional neural nets and also having these multiple levels of resolution that are talking to each other. And and the the, the other difference is so, so the PIV is really focused on the you know identifying these uh, dots and, and what their their motions are the the, the Machine learning is much more generalized. It's going to pick out whatever kinds of general features come out of these convolutional neural nets. You know, you don't even know what what they are. You can figure it out at at, the, at some levels. So it was a, a, a stupid question. So, um, how uh, how is it to get acceleration? So then you can really talk about. Forces if you have a scale bar. But well, these are over damp, so I don't think you're going to ever get it. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so now we, at least in principle, can get you know the data we need. So now we can do some data driven methods. The, the first one I want to show you is automated model discovery. Oh, yeah. So, you know, this is, is I think, broadly applicable. Um, and this actually, I would say, is a concrete example where hopefully machine learning really needs to um, so, so, so the idea is now we would like to, um, you know, discover a continuum hydrodynamic model for these types of systems. We've applied this to a few systems. I'm mostly going to show you the first system we looked at, which is this same 2D active 
So the idea, the, the usual approach here, as I'm sure again, most of you are, are well aware, you first want to identify your relevant hydrodynamic field, which in this case would be the pneumatic tensor, so describing the director field and, and the degree of order, and then the velocity. And then you do a low water symmetry expansion. So you have you know, the, the field and their gradients and combinations of those, and you truncate it at some low order. Uh, and typically you end up with equations like these. So you, you would have equations for the um, dissipation from the pneumatic elastic energy. You would have uh, some kind of uh, Navier-Stokes flow. Uh, we usually use just Stokes flow. Some groups uh, retain the inertia term. And then you have cu coupling between the flow and the pneumatogen. So you have convection, uh, stretching, rotating. And then because these extensile bundles are um, everywhere pushing over on the fluid, this is, is exerting stresses on the fluid, so called active stresses. Uh, and the to lowest order, those will be proportional to the degree of order. And so the lowest order term is just linear and gradients of Q. And importantly, all of these terms have phenomenological coefficients. And so the coefficient in front of the active stress is very important. This is a measure of how active the sample is, and this should depend on the ATP concentration, among other things. So of course, we and you and many groups have used these equations quite successfully, but I would say they do have limitations. So of course, it's not tractable to take these to high order. And so you're stuck essentially just picking a few high order terms that you think are important based on some kind of hopefully physics knowledge or intuition. And then I would argue that until now, these equations have never been quantitatively tested against the experiments. In fact, I don't think in general that the coefficients have been measured. So, so this data-driven model discovery approach allows overcoming all of these problems, at least in principle. So that's what we set out to do. The particular technique we're using is something called CINDY, stands for this sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. So this was developed by Brunton co-workers in the context of fluid turbulence. Um, it's been applied to plasma physics, uh, Lee and a couple other groups like Yard and Dunkel have now had some success applying it to um, active matter. The, the basic idea is very simple. So, so you, you start by getting a, a large data set that uh, has the dynamics that you're interested in. And so for the example I'm going to show you, we got um, active pneumatics data from Bonamere at different uh, ATP concentrations. You then are going to construct a library where, again, you're taking the, the whatever you think might be the important fields and their gradients, and you're going to expand this out in combinations of them to some, you know, user-defined order. And then the idea is that you want to take this and pair it down to a so-called uh, optimal model, which is defined as the most parsimonious model. In other words, the model which needs the, the smallest number of terms in order to accurately represent the data with some you know, user-defined um, accuracy threshold. Uh, and the reasons for doing this are several. One, um, you're gonna avoid overfitting, uh, but also it makes it tractable to actually uh, get quantitative estimates for, for the phenomenological parameters. Importantly, by way, you're going to learn what is actually the important physics based on which terms are retained when you do this. So, so to do this, you need to do some form of sparse regression, as I'll show you shortly. And then importantly, once you're done with that, of course, you have to test your model against the, the data. So, so sorry, can you say something a bit about these complex in terms of is it the smallest number of terms? Or, because I could imagine that you could have you will term, but if you miss the wrong term. Oh, yes. yes. So, so, so if you, well, well, if you miss the wrong term, then 
if you test it extensively enough, it should fail. Right? So the idea is um, we have defined it, and you could define this in, in various ways. We have defined it as the smallest number of terms that have to describe the data. That's what that's our definition, and that's the Cindy definition of uh, of most least complex. Not using any of the equation criteria. So far, we have not. You could you could do that as well. You you can make what I'm gonna the approach that we take. Describe as rigorous. I would describe it as the approach that has worked so far. Um, there are approaches out in the literature trying to use like information criteria. Um, so far, they don't work. Uh, but it would be that's our we're working on making them work. So, so, so this all sounds very straightforward. Maybe not the part about making it rigorous, but at least what I've laid out here, I think should sound very straightforward. In practice, of course, it's totally not because you're dealing with real noisy data full of errors and you have to address all of that. So, so there was a lot of effort by my student Chaitanya and a, a, a postdoc, Chris Amy, that went into actually making this work. And this was done by working both with uh, simulated data where we added noise and then also working with the experimental data and a lot of trial and error on what needs to be done with the data. And I'm just gonna show a little bit of that. Before you go on yeah. about the model, is this, a, is this a noisy model or is it a, is this a purely yes, so, so, or is it plastic? So far we've, we've done deterministic PDEs. There are, there are, you also can do this to get stochastic PDEs. Uh, and, and that may be worth needed for some of these systems that we're not sure about. But uh, we, we just got a deterministic PD. So, so, so you're trying to learn hydrodynamic equations. So, so you need stuff that, that's relevant at long wavelengths. And so you have to do coarse graining on your data to eliminate the, the high frequency noise. But you have to then determine the right first screening length and time scale so that you get rid of the high frequency stuff, but you retain all the physics that's important at long wavelengths. And so this requires identifying characteristic length and time scale. Once you do that, you can, for example, convolve them to the Gaussian kernel. Um, other things you have to do to, to uh, handle errors, you can use integral transforms uh, one thing we found particularly useful when you have higher order derivatives, you can cast your equations in weak form. This allows you to, to throw the derivatives onto a test function. It also allows you to eliminate fields you can't measure, like uh, you can't measure, you don't get pressure in the experiment. So that turns out to be quite useful sometimes. So, so Michael, I guess you have like, this is part of the experimentalist to tune these kind of um, thresholding, but you mentioned before that you you kind of want an automated process. So could you have this as part of the model, like uh, in the sense of, yeah. can you have an automated way of screen? Yeah, you, you, you can do this as a hyperparameter search, sure, yeah. The other thing, you can do it as a pure hyperparameter search. You also, to some extent, can identify these by actually looking at the data. So for example, you know, what are the defects? Um, spacing sizes and time scales, but it's honestly probably better to do it as a hyperparameter search and then make sure that what comes out of it makes sense and works. And oh, it's also important in a, a, to identify collinear terms, which you won't necessarily know ahead of time, so I won't go into details on that. You have to check the terms that come out of it. That will cause you problems when you we don't. So, so the first thing we did as a test was we wanted something where we have a ground truth. And so, so we took the equations that I'm showing you here. I'm only showing you the alignment equation, but there's also a fluid equation. We numerically integrated these added synthetic noise and we apply this method to the data. And again, the idea is you expand out 
this comprehensive library, and then you're going to perform some kind of uh, uh, sparse regression on it. The particular approach that we found to be useful, um, we've used several, but this was one that has been particularly reliable so far. It's so called sequentially thresholded sparse regression. The idea here is you have your terms, you're going to drop them one by one, and each time dropping the term that increases the error by the least. And so what's shown here is one minus the R squared coefficient on a log scale as a function of the number of terms. There's actually something like 300 terms in the library. I'm just showing you the end of the process here. And so you're going to keep dropping the term, measuring the change in error. You keep doing this until you reach some accuracy threshold, or even better, suddenly see a large jump in the error. And this identifies to you that all of the terms, including this one, are terms that you need in the model, because if you don't have them, you have a high error or get rid of all the rest of these terms. And sure enough, when we did that, it was exactly these terms that came out of the process. So as a devil's advocate, so if there was to push on the x axis to infinity, would you expect it to? So would you expect this curve to be monotonic, or would you expect if I had? Well, if, it has to be monotonic yeah. because of the the way we're doing it. Well, with some caveat, um, it is possible that that it could sort of get into local minima when, when you do this. And so there is an alternative if your library is not too huge or you're willing to throw it up computation on it that you can just enumerate every term and do like you know the, the full treatment so each number of terms find the optimal model and we've also done that as well but usually this approach is good enough so so um this is now the uh, same approach, but, but applied to the experimental system. And so each of the curves here is showing the error as a function of the number of terms for a different sample at a different ATP concentration. So you see, of course, it's not as clean as it is for the simulations, but, but we are able to get a consensus model out from, from these samples. Uh, and that's what I'm showing here. And I would say the notable thing about this mon model is how uh, minimal it is. And in particular, it's completely dominated by the, the flow coupling. So, so you actually don't see the terms coming from the elastic free end. Where's the threshold? Uh, okay. Yeah, the, generally, it, the threshold is where these arrows are coming out. Is it, oh, okay, so the, the right, right, sorry, is, sorry, some of these arrows are no, it's not actually where the arrows are coming out. The, the threshold, like here, is where the arrow is coming out of, but, but not for some of these other. So, I don't have it marked on here, but generally, it's where you see these large jumps. So, some of the sometimes it becomes a little bit difficult when you have these shoulders like this. And so this did take some effort to, to determine, you know, whether or not these terms were, were important. Is it obvious that you must have a threshold? I mean, in the well, no, so, so, so it's not because what's happening um, in, in some of these cases, and, and this is the result of, of the fact that this is real noisy errorful data. So, so some of these terms, it becomes somewhat ambiguous how, how important they are because the error is changing, but not by by so much. Um, the, the way we addressed this was by looking at, at all of these different samples. And then sometimes, oftentimes, when, when you're on the threshold here, what you would find is um, that the terms would come in, but, but they would not be obeying physics. So for, for example, these equations should be isotropic, but, but you would get um, terms that say have only the X direction, but not the Y direction. And so we're able to, to disambiguate the terms on the threshold using 
physics knowledge like that. Actually, I was going to ask. So you said you had three hundred terms. So, like you, so, so you included the usual suspects. You said. Yeah. But what were the other? Terms? I mean, it's like, just any combination of these fields and all the all the lower order power. Yeah. Yeah. And so one thing that we didn't do, which in practice you would do, but we specifically did not do this as a test, is in practice what you should do is you should keep only the terms that are consistent with uh, symmetry constraints that you know from physics. So for example, all the tensors should be isotropic. Um, this system should obey Galilean invariants. We specifically did not do that because as a test, we wanted to see if that was going to emerge from the process. And it actually did. So here I'm showing coefficients of the convective terms. And if it has Galilean invariants, they should be one and negative one. And again, within some error, that that's what we found. Yep. Um, so presumably, if you uh, just randomly draw these terms, um, dropping this, this uh, actual uh, terms that are based the physics, we just evoke a um, certain jump in, in this. That's the idea, yeah. So, uh, I don't know if this is an ensemble um, average of, of this dropping or. Um, what do you mean by an ensemble average? So, so we typically, um, we had. Um, um, I guess I didn't exactly explain how we're doing this. So, so we have a, a bunch of data at each of, of these samples. So you have uh, many um, measurements of dynamics from frame to frame. So you have a huge data set and you are picking um, a sparse set of points in space and time from that data set you're going to run this algorithm on that. You can do that multiple times, picking different subsets okay. of the data. That is what I mean. Yeah. yeah. So, Michael, just on, so yeah, as physicists, if we know something for sure, it's like we want to put that in. You probably should. But, but so, so, what's in terms of um, put in Be as easy as it sounds to actually get to converge to. That's the rear end most. So when you retain the like, higher order terms, uh, or, or those coefficients small? Well, it, the, it's not necessarily that the coefficient is small because it depends on the actual magnitude of the term itself. So it, it's, it's the contribution of the term as a whole that matters. Ideally, if everything is non-dimensionalized properly, the, the magnitude of the coefficient will tell you something, but it doesn't always work out that way because the actual term itself can vary. So, so this is showing the same thing for the velocity equation. Um, this turned out to be very simple. It um, was- so, Sorry, we can't see the, the trace term. I think the, the zoom. Oh, it's, uh, it's sick. Sorry. <laughs> I honestly don't know how to do that thing. Yeah. But it's not here on my screen. Yeah, okay. Sorry, it's no, no. really annoying. So maybe, maybe so you can look up half of it and then go back in. It's just not you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's completely unimportant. It's trace q squared times u. You can also drag that thing and bring it in. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. Thanks. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 So it ends up being dominated by the, the viscous dissipation that you would expect. And this lowest order active stress term 
So, so what's important is what then is not there, and this is where you're learning some physics. As I said, a lot. Of sorry, um, Mike. So, what about what are your A one and A two? Your your convective, your in your Stokes. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so these are the phenomenological coefficients that yeah. it's going to estimate. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So, okay. Fine. Well, I thought I thought you were going to tell us that 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 it doesn't it doesn't find the find the correct zero. Yeah. Yeah, the, the things I put in boxes are what it found. Sorry, okay. this wasn't clear. So, so the ultimate equation, it was actually supposed to gray out the rest of it. Apparently it's not. But um, this is the equation that it found, the two terms that are in boxes. The rest of these are unimportant. Now, the inertia. And also the uh, substrate friction term. So, so this tells you that that the, the screening length for substrate friction, at least under these conditions, must be large. Um, the other thing is, it's, it's incompressibility. How it, it doesn't find it doesn't find the. Oh, it does. It's the when you simulate these equations, um, they're they're incompressible. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just, what I'm saying is, does it find the incompressibility? Ah, uh, so so these we we um actually put the equation in weak form. Mm -hmm. And so there is a pressure term in there, but yes. that you end up throwing on to boundary conditions. So, so I, I would say you're not actually enforcing incompressibility, but it's consistent with incompressibility. But then, then when you go back and integrate it, it does uh, satisfy you. Because the, the experimental data itself, you know, it's, when you when you measure it, it's incompressible. It doesn't technically have to be because these are thin films. Mm -hmm. have stuff. But when we measure the velocities, that they are they are divergent. So, so the other important thing, which I haven't mentioned only a little bit so far, is that it is measuring the values of these coefficients. And so, for example, this a three is actually this important activity coefficient divided by the viscosity. We know what the viscosity is. So this tells us what the activity is now as a function of ATP constant. So that's what's shown here. Those are the points that are in green. And to my knowledge, this is the first measurement of how this depends on ATP. So, so this is, I would say, actually quite important that we've finally been able to measure. It has a form you would expect. It goes up and then it eventually saturates. But we've never been able to, to see this before. Um, now it's also very important that you're testing this, and we, we did this in a number of ways. One is right here. We know from theory that this the inverse of this, this is basically the inverse of the active time scale. And so that should be equal to the uh, inverse of the velocity autocorrelation time. That we can measure independently from the experiments that's shown in blue and they match quantitative. So that's reassuring. The other way you test this, of course, is you take your learned equations and then you numerically integrate them and you compare them against the um, experiments. That's shown here. First, I'm just showing videos. So this is video of the experiment. This is the, the model. Here, the, the dots are the plus half and minus half defects. So, you know, visually they, they look the same, but you can now quantitatively test. And so, for example, what I'm showing here is the defect lifetime. The um, blue points are from the model, and those are at different activity coefficients. The green points are the experiments at the corresponding ATP concentration they're pretty close to quantitatively matching because there's no additional fit parameter here. This is just using the parameters that were learned from, from the data. And you can do similar, yeah, the circle is where these movies are from. You can do similar things with other quantities like defect density. So it seems to work pretty well. Um, and so conclusions from this are that, A, it seems to work. You can learn equations. Uh, I think more importantly, at the same time, you can quantitatively estimate the parameters, which is something that I think has been lacking so far, and you learn physics, in particular what, what physical terms do and don't contribute significantly to um, capture the data.
that's significant in time. I'll just check with those three back. Is because you you end up not needing the thermodynamics. Correct. Is this you secretly put a constraint on the magnitude of your so these equations you can probably guess if you um integrate them just like this won't be stable. So so we have to put a fourth order derivative in there to make it stable. I'm just thinking about the, the strength of the matter movement. Uh, we have you it. Know, it's normally the, the, the elastic to make it have the equilibrium strength. And you could imagine that under what appear to be purely kinematic equations, it would change its magnitude significantly. So we did so, not, yeah, we did not put that constraint. Okay. Mm -hmm. We could talk more about why. Um, it's not finding any of the elastic terms because um, we actually looked into this pretty extensively. We were curious. Um, and so one thing that's happening is even though this is chaotic and there's lots of defects running around, most of this sample is actually away from defects where, where the system is pretty well aligned. Mm -hmm. And if you go and focus exactly on you know regions in the vicinity of defects, you will find a larger contribution from the elastic for energy term. And we think that even though ultimately they're going to come in as less important, we actually would like to know their coefficients are um, if they're there. And, and so we think it would be useful in the future to actually focus Data, you know, the, the data to some extent on the region in the vicinity of defects, and we, we may get some estimates of, of those terms. But that's something we haven't done yet. I mean, the, the other thing about the system, the six system is that it's um, there's a fluid above and below the, the layer, so therefore the hydrodynamics I would expect is, would not just be, I'd expect there to be something about coupling to the. This, this sub. So under these conditions, it told us pretty clearly that that does not contribute to the thing. Now, yeah. what we're thinking is if you change the film thickness, eventually it should, but we haven't gotten the data on that. Bonner was supposed to run experiments on that, but you know, he's got to run a lot of experiments. So we, we think that, that indeed at some point the substrate friction should matter and you should see it. We would love it if, you know, find out when. So, so I think I have not so much time left. What I wanted to show you is that you can now use these equations and combine them with optimal control theory to actually make the system do something useful to me. Account for that. This is so, so if you're gonna do that, you need a means to to apply actuation and the, the, typically, the way this is being done is with light. So, so they have these um, optogenetic uh, kinesin clusters, and basically they're active only when a uh, light is shown on them. So this is showing where, where they're shining light just in this region in space, and then on the right is shown where the light is uniform, but is turning on and off over time. And this is showing the mean speed of the sample, the function of time of this sample. I should say that Zvonimir did a lot of work recently to make this as well as it does. So previously, these optogenetic mesons were there, but they were far from switch-like and probably weren't good enough for control. Zvonimir has made them so they're really switch-like. So in principle, this is good enough to, to control the system. But what is needed then is for theorists to say, how do you shine the light in space and time in order to drive the system into a particular state. And uh, two approaches to doing this. One is we take the model we just learned or something like it, and we combine it with optimal control theory to identify the optimal um, light signal in space and time. The other is you just throw the equations out and you use deep learning and reinforcement learning to tell you what situation. So which, which states would you which states are that which states would you like? Yeah, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. Like the, the thing to do, you know, anything you want to do, right? So, so, but yeah, give you some concrete examples. I have not much time. Um 
probably most of you are, are I think John gave lectures on, on this last week. Um, but basically what, what you wanna do is you take your equation, but now activity depends on space and time. You have an initial condition, you have a target state you wanna to get to, and you have to solve for the alpha that's gonna get you there. This is a boundary value problem and there are techniques to solve it. We, my students at Torchy has implemented this in the finite element solver. Um, there's an objective function. Um, the objective function is gonna include the target, which could be the, the velocity, the and or the director field. You also wanna put some terms in regularization that are gonna you know, limit control input and rapid gradient. So it's constraints on the knobs, right? Yeah. yeah, experimentally, you cannot put infinite light in, you cannot have negative activity in this, and so on. So, so this is one example. This was the first, this was actually done by Mike Norton, a postdoc who was working with us. But he did here, this is, when you confine this system, you get this system, you get these co-rotating defects. And once it starts going with a particular handedness, the, um, it'll stay in that handedness forever. And Mike was able to come up with the activity sequence that would split the handedness to go from rotating one direction to the other direction. In the movie, we're not playing in sync, but you get the idea. So this is an example where you're just switching between two existing dynamical attractors. Now more recently, Satoshi has shown that you can take the system the states that are not attractors at all. So states you absolutely could not get to in the absence of control. He's done many examples on this system and another system. I'm just gonna show you quickly one or two if I have time. So the first example is we have a chaotic bulk system and this little square, we're gonna try to flatten the pneumatic inside of this square. So what's shown on the right here is the activity sequence that solved for not coming out that great on this screen. But what's happening is initially there's light being shown in the box that's driving the defects out. And then at later times, there's going to be light shown in the periphery that's going to keep new defects from coming into the square. And then you're going to get a mostly flat thematic arriving once that happens. In the next example, what we're going to try to do is um, basically create a channel through a bulk sample, but the walls of the channel are made of light. So basically what we want is to generate a coherent flow through this strip that's shown here. And it turns out, depending on the activity level that you target, you can identify different solutions. I'm showing a solution here, which we found out at a somewhat higher activity level. What's going to happen is it's going to start shining the, the light that's dictated by the, the color down here. You're going to get an initial bend instability forming. Eventually, the system is going to decide that it needs to form defects. These defects are, are then eventually going to arrange themselves so that you have a system of co-rotating that are going to... This was... A, a, not, not what I expected as the solution that was going to come out of this. You got a more kind of intuitive solution. Or, so, so basically, as I said, we've done this on, on, on a, a variety of, of different targets like this. We've done, we've also done this on a, a polar system. So it seems like you've been pretty reliable, pretty reliably as long as you're we put noise into the system that we can still work pretty well. I had a great talk with John about
So we, we first did this a, a couple of years ago. Again, this is working with uh, Peng Yu. Um, and, and the idea here is uh, he developed a, a deep learning model where you give it a, a sequence of images, so fluorescence images from the sample, uh, and then you train it on a, a subsequent sequence of images from the sample. So, so in, for example, we would give it eight images in the past, and it has to predict the dynamics sometime into the future. During training, it compares against the images that you've taken from the sample. And then once it's trained, you just give it a number of images and it will predict the dynamics into the future for you. It was fairly successful. So it, it's, it's able to predict the dynamics fairly accurately on time scales, long enough for defects to move you know, well beyond their size that predicts events like defect nucleation, annihilation, things like that. So here is shown an example where it predicted this event where a defect was uh, nucleated. This is what actually happened and this is what the, the algorithm predicted. So can I ask how that compares with, um, you could take the model equations that you discovered <clears throat> and also integrate them in time. Yeah, yeah. Which, which one does better? So yeah, we haven't tested that. Um, we we always meant to do that, and we haven't done it yet. Um, I don't actually know why. I guess we just the student graduated. <laughs> I guess that's the real answer. But yeah, it's something that I want to do. I'm not actually happy with. I don't. I would like this to predict that, that it's obviously never going to be able to predict it beyond, you know, the, the, lock, the off and off time, but I would like it to do better. This is something Fu is working on. Um, so he's doing several things to make it better. One is combining it with these machine learning techniques to extract the flow, the director field. I don't know if you all care too much about the machine learning details, but um, He's basically using newer things from the machine learning literature. Uh, I would say one thing that, that's interesting and we're trying to put some physics in is we, we now um, project the input onto a latent space. So a, a, a much lower dimensional system and the dynamics prediction is actually done in that latent space. And what Fu is working to do is do that projection in such a way that it retains some of the physics, for example, um, maximizing correlation, autocorrelation between the dynamics. And the hope is that, that this will actually focus on features that correspond to, you know, the, the um, slow degree of freedom in the system. And this has been somewhat successful so far. So what I'm showing you here is the new algorithm in comparison to the old one. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of this. Basically, this is showing the, the, the error, uh, the, the, the pixel error between the prediction and the ground truth as a function of a uh, predicted frame into the future. <laughs> the, the, the old model is in pink, the new one is in blue. The, the new one so far works very well up to the length that we trained it for starts to become progressively less accurate after that. And so Fu is working on making it extend even further out. It looks like this can be made to be pretty reliable. So, so that's the first phase. Once you have a forecaster like this, uh, if you want to you know, exert control on it, then you, you need something that's going to tell you again what that light signal should be. And so the approach is to combine this with reinforcement learning to identify, given where we are now, the target state we want to get to, what, what should the um, 
light field be, and that, that's something that uh, we're working on. So I think I can finish with that. Go to the thousands of funding, particularly the, the DOE, also NSF. I think I mentioned most of the people. Uh, I skipped over the stuff Chris has done. Chris has been applying Cindy to new system, in particular. Um, He's been applying it to dry active pneumatics, which have produced some interesting preliminary results. Much more complicated, actually, than, than the wet active pneumatics. But this is all collaboration, importantly, with Aparna. And then um, anyone who has students looking for postdocs, we have a postdoc position on stuff similar to this, but, but a new system that Bonamere has developed in collaboration with Christina. So, Thanks, Paul. Any questions? Um, we have a question. Okay, I've got a question. Yes, two questions. First question is. Um, I could imagine these systems could have memory first, things like that. So, I mean, so the, the equations that you, that you wrote down for your for the for the, for the model you have learned didn't include that possibility. You you, you mean like some viscoelastic? Yes. 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 Or yeah. Some, or some essentially some. So I mean, so I of course you think you then create some vicious variables to deal with that, but but but. So, so you could create some fictitious variable to deal with that, or you could also put additional types of fields in your library and ask them to do better. Exactly. I think ultimately you should do that. We're actually working one of the systems I didn't show you very likely does have memory because this is a system that uh, Air and Seth developed where you take the active microtubule mixture and you put it in a passive active network suspension that has all kinds of like super cool behaviors. And it seems very likely you're, you're gonna need this elastic term there. And so, so, so when we finally get to it, we'll definitely are going to be including those in the library as well. But I think you're bringing up a good point, which is, you know, to, to, the, the right way to do this um, is to try all different sorts of, of fields, basically model discovery that's not just term by term, but also comparing different types of models. I think this may not be very well. You may yeah. find that if you exactly. have some fields, then you find out it tells you about Maybe yeah. that's yeah. you know, get better. It seems to me if you start doing that, you, you, at some point, you're going to have to go basic. I agree. Maybe with some, you know, subtleties to do with. Yeah. The, the only thing wrong with the Bayesian method is that it will reject a model because it isn't perfect. You know, because you have really good data which shows the model isn't quite true, then it says this model is not true. Whereas, in fact, I may be just model one of the physicists because we want to do something. Right, right. Um, but, and so there should be some way of Compromise between that and you will say, I don't want more than 10 to, to get some kind of you know, cross functional yes. model. Which, but if you don't go basically comparing different models, it's going to be. I agree, I agree. Yeah. I mean, it was already difficult enough you know, dealing with the experimental data. I agree, when it gets more complicated. That is something that is on our list. So have you tried uh, different uh, cost functions or mm -hmm. terms of cost function and how does that uh, affect the efforts? Yeah, so um you should cost function. Sure. Um cost function pretty good. Yes. But I, I can tell you a few things that we have tried. Let me get there. Um so first of all, for sure. The things that matter in the cost function without even changing its form are if you change these coefficients, because here you're basically weighting things like how strong is the constraint on the activity level 
how strong are you avoiding rapid gradients? And so, you know, if you make these too large, then it, it's going to eventually become impossible for the system to actually be able to control. So there is, is a trade off there. Um, this term we added in because if you don't have this term and you don't impose a constraint on the system, it will actually very happily give you negative activities which you don't want for this system. So, so we, we had to either put a constraint in or, or put this uh, term in. Um, you could, you know, add in other types of terms. I think, you know, as your imagination dictates what other term you might like to put in. Uh, another thing you could do, so, so, so far we have targeted typically just a final state, but you could also, actually we so far have just integrated these over time. You can do, you can have your target integrated over time. You can have it as one final state. It's kind of up to you how you want to arrange your cost. Um, So are those those were are those were your final the last the second term you know, I mean sorry in the middle middle thing. Yeah, I didn't explain this exactly. So, yeah. so what's happening here is you need to enforce the system dynamics. So this F sub U and F sub Q are the actual equations of motion. Right. It's your one screen. It's a, I assume exactly what John is. I guess we would we, for your J3 term. Could you have done something like say alpha is e to the something and then we tried that and for whatever reason that wasn't working well and this worked much better. I have no idea why that should be. Okay, so then that's yeah. Yeah.